My fellow forgiven sinners, grace and peace are yours from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. These are the words of a man in Charles Dickens' novel, A Tale of Two Cities. The man was about to give his life, but as he looked back, he realized that his death was more meaningful and would accomplish more good than the sum total of all of his years. The man died better than he lived. Today we read about a similar man in Judges chapter 16, a man named Samson, a man who died better than he lived. And through the life and death of Samson, our God will teach us to avoid making the same mistakes that he did. Today our God calls us to walk the path that our Savior Jesus Christ walked. First the cross, then the crown. Jesus first walked that path of death and suffering. But through that, he bought the crown of life, not only for himself, but for the entire world. Today, as Christians, our God calls us to also walk that path of the cross first. Then we will find the path of the crown. Our God calls us to die to ourselves and to die to the world. Though our sinful nature hates that idea and really doesn't want to follow that, our God shows us that it is far, far better to die to the world than to live for the world. Samson learned that the hard way. You see, Samson lived for the world and he got the world. The man had everything. He had power. He had fame. He was a literal living legend. The guy could do whatever he wanted. All of his enemies were terrified of him. He could do anything he pleased. With the fame and power that he had came all number of perks. Any luxury he desired, he could enjoy it. He could have any woman that he wanted. And he did. Nothing seemed impossible for Samson. In fact, it seemed that Samson's power even extended up to heaven itself. You see, God was clearly on Samson's side. All of Samson's incredible strength came directly from God. And Samson himself was dedicated to God. A fact that he showed by never once in his life having his hair cut. Samson knew that God was in his corner. One moment in his life, after Samson had defeated a thousand enemy soldiers single-handedly, Samson then called out to God because he was thirsty, and God supernaturally provided water for him right there. Samson had absolutely everything going for him. But Samson still felt there was something missing. With all that Samson had, he still found that he was never satisfied. He never seemed to be able to find a woman who could please him. He found many different ones, but none of them seemed to work out. He tried to gamble for wealth and for luxuries, but that didn't seem to work out either. Throughout his life, the Philistines, the enemies of the Israelites, were a constant thorn in his side, but every single time they wronged him, he made sure they got exactly what they deserved. But even with all that, Samson was always missing something. He just never felt satisfied. Finally, we read about Samson falling in love with a woman named Delilah. Delilah asked Samson what the secret of his strength was. Three times, in fact. She asked him about that strength. Three times, Samson lied to her. And he told her that if he was bound in some specific way, that he would become as weak as any other man. Three times, he woke up from a nap, only to find himself bound in exactly the way he had told Delilah. And he was surrounded by enemy soldiers. But each time, he still had his strength. No big deal. But then Delilah asks Samson a fourth time, 
what the secret of his strength was. Samson actually tells her. When I was a kid, I remember thinking to myself, Samson, how can you be so dumb? You know she's just going to do it. You know that she's done it the last three times. Why wouldn't she do it now? You know she's going to cut your hair. You know you're going to lose your strength. What are you thinking? I think Samson did know what he was doing. I think Samson did know that Delilah was going to cut his hair. I think Samson did it just because he was tired. He was tired of, of his strength getting him nowhere. He was fed up with his fame. He was exhausted by chasing something in his life and just not getting it. Here he was with the woman that he loved, clearly plotting against him and trying to get him killed. What more did Samson have to live for? I think Samson knew exactly what he was doing when he told Delilah about his secret, about his dedication to God. And so it happened. He lost his hair, that sign of his dedication to God, and with the hair went Samson's strength. He lost everything. His power, gone. His fame, turned to shame. He now had nothing. Although Samson himself probably figured he didn't really have all that much to begin with. It's at this point where Samson has been thrown into a Philistine prison. He's had his eyes gouged out and he's at his lowest that our reading for today begins. And it begins on a hopeful note. The lesson says the hair on Samson's head began to grow again. You know, as Samson sat in that prison cell blind, doing the manual labor he was forced to do, weak and powerless, I think God blessed him with time to think. And as Samson looked back on his life, I think Samson started to realize some of the mistakes that he had made. Samson started to realize that, yeah, he had been dedicated to God his whole life. Yeah, the whole no haircut thing. But even with that, his life wasn't truly dedicated to God. That was only an external thing. Instead, Samson realized that his life had been dedicated to getting personal revenge against the Philistines. His life had been dedicated to chasing after whatever earthly pleasure jumped into his mind at the moment. Samson realized that in his efforts to chase after life and to obtain that, that he had actually lost his soul. Samson realized that God had given him a mission in his life. The reason that he had this incredible strength was not so that he could do whatever he wanted with it, not so that he could get revenge on those who wronged him personally, not so that he could chase whatever fame and fortune and power that he wanted. Instead, he was supposed to use that strength to defend the nation of Israel, to defend God's people from their enemies. So that one day from that line of the Israelites, a promised Savior could be born for the entire world. And Samson had absolutely wasted the opportunity to fulfill that mission. But in spite of Samson's wasted life, Samson recognized that his God was merciful. Samson remembered that his God is the God who forgives sins and wickedness, even entire lifetimes of sin and wickedness. Samson realized how his God had continued to bless him with that incredible strength, even when he used it for sinful purposes. Samson realized that God continued to care for him day after day after day, even as he was completely ignoring God and his will for, for Samson's life. Samson realized that his God had really humbled him 
with all that kindness. Humbled him far more than, than any humiliation he could receive from the Philistines laughing at him, now powerless. And in repentance, Samson decided to give up that life. Samson decided he would no longer live chasing those earthly pleasures. He would no longer live abusing the strength that God had given to him. Instead, Samson was finally going to be the man that God had called him to be. Samson would fulfill his mission of defeating Israel's enemies so that that line of the Savior could be protected. And no, Samson wasn't perfect at this point, even in his repentance. We still see that hint of revenge as he prays to God. Yet with his last words, we find Samson finally on the right path, walking first the path of the cross. Samson says, let me die with the Philistines. In the Hebrews there, he says, let my life, let my soul die with the Philistines. Samson was dying to himself. He was dying to his views of what he should get out of life. He was dying to his own conceptions of what life is. And instead walking the path that God had called him to. This was a prayer of repentance. And in this way, Samson died better than he lived. In fact, the writer of the book of Judges even confirms that. He tells us that Samson killed many more of Israel's enemies in his death than when he lived. May God teach us the lesson that Samson learned at the end of his life. You see, you and I have a similar call to Samson. No, we aren't called to take lives. No, we aren't called to defend some nation until a Savior can be born, because Jesus has already been born. Instead, our God has called us to die to ourselves and to die to the world. Our God has called us to walk that path of first the cross and then the crown. And that's not an easy path to walk. It's a painful one. It's a path of suffering. It's a path of shame. It's a path of death. It's not one that we naturally want to walk. But we don't walk this path because we need to earn salvation. Because Jesus earned that for us. Instead, we walk this path because Jesus has already won salvation for us. We learn to listen to God, the creator of life. We learn to live our lives according to what he tells us so that we don't waste the years that God gives us. Our sinful nature sees our friends and family only for what they can do for me. Our sinful nature looks at other people and asks, well, what enjoyment are they going to add to my life? Now, absolutely. Our spouses and children, our friends and family, they, they do add enjoyment to our lives. That's true. But that is not their purpose. Their purpose is people to whom we can be servants, people whom we can build up, people whom we can love as ourselves. This is the kind of relationships that our God wants us to have. This is the way our God wants us to see those relationships. So our God calls us to give up that sinful view of other people. Our sinful nature sees our jobs and our careers as a way to pay for our cost of living, as a way to get from month to month, or as a way for us to amass wealth so that we can retire comfortably. Yeah, God does give us money and jobs that, that we can get enjoyment out of, but that's not their purpose. The purpose of those things is for us to have opportunities to meaningfully serve those around us, to serve our neighbors. When we try to make those things the center point of our lives, we will only, like Samson, be unfulfilled. We'll find them to be meaningless because that's what they are. Instead, they are opportunities to serve, and our God calls us to give up seeing money and careers in those ways. Our sinful nature sees ourselves as the good people, 
He looks down on everybody else. But that's not the purpose of morality. The purpose of morality isn't to build ourselves up and to break everybody else down. The purpose of morality is to accept what God tells us about ourselves. That I am thoroughly and utterly sinful and that I need a Savior. That the only way to be a good person, the only way to be perfect in God's sight, is through God's mercy alone, which he has shown to us in Jesus Christ. Our God calls us to give up that sinful, self-righteous view of ourselves. It's painful to give those things up. It's painful to die to those views of ourselves. And it's going to be rough if we actually live the way our God calls us to. It's going to hurt at times. It's going to be painful. We are going to suffer. When we love our neighbors as ourselves, we're going to get hurt sometimes. When we view money and our careers in the way that that God wants us to view them, we're going to miss out on some fun times. When we take a biblical view of who we are and recognize just how sinful we are, that is a painful and humbling reality. But life is not all about minimizing pain and maximizing pleasure. One day, when we are in heaven, then we will experience life the way it's supposed to be. We will experience a life of no pain, not just minimized pain. We will figure out what it's like to actually love each other unselfishly and to love our God without any sinful motives in our hearts. We'll see what it's actually like to work in service to our neighbor and to have those opportunities for, for meaningful service. We will know, not just through faith, what it is to be perfect in Jesus, but we will actually be perfect in heaven. Dear friends, Today our God calls us to walk the path that Jesus walked. First the cross, then the crown. Jesus' cross has paid for the sins of the entire world, including yours and mine. Because of his cross, we have the crown of life waiting for us in heaven. But so long as we walk this earth, we still walk the path of the cross. We are still called to suffer for Jesus' name to die to ourselves, to die to this world. But we fear not, because we know the path that we walk. It's the same path that Jesus walked. First the cross, then the crown. Amen.